so it would save you, Representative McCombie, from selling a gun to a dangerous person like myself. Actually, it would say online through the ISP that you, have, do, you do not have a valid card. Again, it is a, ch a check and a balance to make sure that the process is being followed, that no one is quickly flashing a FOID card. We are, we are just trying to make the law safer for, for people. It, it, this, this, unfortunately, this piece especially will not do anything. If, I'm, if I am not going to follow the process now as a law-abiding gun owner to sell you and transfer a weapon to you, I'm not going to go to the FFL dealer, period. The other problem with this is that you don't there's a cap your time on the transfer. Expired. Will someone yield the time? Uh, over Repres there. Representative Stevens, here's your time. There's, the other part of this that the, that's a problem is there is a cap for the FFL dealer to uh, what, what the charge can be. Correct? Uh, the cap on the, I'm sorry, the background check charge or nope, the fingerprint nope. charge? for the transfers for the private oh, through the yes. FFL. Okay. So is there anything that requires an FFL dealer to do transfers, to do this? Is there anything that's going to mandate them to offer this service to you and I? I don't believe so. Okay, great. Because I can tell you, my FF dealers are not going to be doing this for this fee. That's going to limit my ability to transfer or sell a weapon. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. That's going to happen. Another thing, fingerprints. You stated there's a cap on the fingerprints. Is there any law that would mandate somebody to provide this service? Not that I know of. It's a service. Okay. Yeah. So this would be another thing that is very costly, in some cases especially, that people are not going to provide this service. That is also going to limit my ability to carry. There are many things in this that are not only going to increase fees, limit our ability to carry, it's also going to create new laws that are going to be increased penalties. Increased penalties to people that want to be law-abiding citizens, but cannot because of accessibility and affordability. To the bill. This is not about public health. It's not about public safety. It is just another gun grab in Illinois. Please vote no. Representative Manley. Will the sponsor yield? Indicate she will. Representative, uh, I have a couple questions for you, and I want to make sure that everybody's listening to this on the record. I told you I was going to ask you these questions, and um, I hope everybody takes note. When the bill leaves this chamber, as I, I'm sure it will, and gets to the Senate, are there going to be amendments brought, and then will the bill come back on concurrence? Yes, Leader, that's correct. Okay. So can you point to some of the things that are, you've committed to changing and um, not concurring with if they don't come back in their entirety? Yes, Leader. I am committed to changing the fee and the duration of the FOID card from $20 to five years back down to $10 and 10 years. We are committed to adding a public defender to the FOID review board. And we are committed to changing the appeals decision time um, on FOID revocation review board. Um, those are the things we've agreed to so far. Okay, so right now, how much does it cost for a FOID card? What's the fee? Currently, it costs $10. Okay. In the bill, though, it says what? The bill says $20. Okay, and we're going to roll that back to $10 in the Senate. When it comes back here, that's what we're going to be concurring with, right? Correct. And also, the renewal is five years, but you're going to move that to 10 years. Correct. So we're voting on 
$20 in five years, but when it comes back, we're going to get a 10 for 10. Yes. Okay. Talk about the fingerprints a little bit. And, and I just want, it, it's hard to listen to people saying that, that this bill won't do anything and it's a gun grab. Because I want you to explain to everybody in this chamber what would have happened if the fingerprinting part of your bill was in place the, before the Aurora shooting. And I know somebody said, oh, it's sad. Well, no, it's not just sad, it's tragic and awful. And I commend you for trying to fix, and if it's the only thing that's fixed, if that's the only thing that happens because we brought this legislation, then it was a success. So please, explain to the people that are, you know, are saddened by the killing in Aurora, but don't think that this would fix it. Can you tell them how this would have made a difference? Absolutely, Leader. Thank you for that question. If the Henry Pratt shooter had had to have a, finger, a mandated fingerprint for his FOID card, it would have been a comprehensive and complete background check that would have caught the aggravated felony charge that he had in Mississippi, and he would never have gotten a FOID card or a gun. I'm sorry, did you say that if the fingerprinting component of this bill had been in place, that those people might not be dead today? Absolutely, there would be six people alive and five uninjured law enforcement. So, I'm really, I don't understand why that's a bad thing, you guys. I don't understand. We could have saved, how many people died there, Maura? Six. Six people would be alive today. I think their families are probably feeling a little bit more than sad. Let's get some of this right. It's a piece of a puzzle. She has explained it. She has made a commitment to coming back to this chamber with a more um, amenable term, you know, renewal term and better, uh, lower fees. She's working with you. She's working with you. I don't know one bill that's come out of this chamber that's been perfect, but there are pieces of this bill that work and would make a difference. I recommend an I vote. Leader Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, to the bill. Ladies and gentlemen, I am a law abiding gun owner. I have a valid FOID card. I have a valid concealed carry card. And I am not alone in the district that I represent. I am not alone. There is nothing in this bill that is about the safety of the citizens in the state of Illinois that are the subject of most of the gun violence that goes on in this state. There are exceptions, and I will admit that. But I think we all have to recognize the fact that most of the gun violence that goes on in the state of Illinois is not by individuals that have valid FOID cards and valid concealed carry cards. That's not what it's about, folks. They don't give a damn about this, and they don't possess them. And where did they get their arms? From the back seat or the trunk of a car. They didn't go to a a, a bona fide FFL dealer. They didn't go to a gun store. They didn't take a class on safety and education. In the district that I represent, the young children belong to an educational sporting shooting group where they learn gun safety, they learn how to handle a firearm, and they learn how to treat it. And more importantly, how to treat their fellow human beings. Ladies and gentlemen, the people that I represent, the people that are legal and law-abiding gun owners, in the district that I represent, 
They own those firearms because they like to hunt. They like to go with their teenagers when they're of age. They may be disabled. And that's one of the few things that they can enjoy on a disabled hunt. But more importantly, and please listen very carefully, people, more importantly, the majority of the people that I represent, they hunt to feed their families. That's where their food comes from. And so, when you're putting all of these regulations and fees, you're putting those on the people that I represent that are trying to feed their families. Vote no. Representative Luft. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the sponsor yield? She indicates she will. Thank you. Representative Hershauer, I just had to take a quick second. I wanted to, and I'm not sure that it, the answer came across, but just a quick second back to the funding. Originally, it was set at $20, and it's my understanding that that was to be broken down to $10 for the State Police Firearm Service Fund, $10 to the State Police Revocation Enforcement Fund. You indicated that when this went to the Senate, that this would be back, dropped back down to $10. So I'm, I have to ask, with that being dropped back down over on the other floor to $10, would that $10 fee still be dispersed as $6 to the Wildlife and Fish Fund, $1 to the State Police Services Fund, and $3 to the State Police Firearm Services Fund. Thank you for that question, Representative. Um, in the negotiations in the Senate, uh, the uh, fees that go to DNR will go back to ISP, and that line item will be taken care of uh, in the budget for DNR. Thank you. So there, there is going to have to be an increase somewhere, correct? I'm not sure I understand. For, for DNR, to replace that funding that they would lose. It will come from somewhere else, that's correct. So there would have to be more funding created somewhere, somehow. That is being negotiated in the Senate. Okay, thank you. Um, also, the $30 fee uh, that has been discussed or talked about, um, how does that break down and where does that, where does that go exactly and who is doing the fingerprinting? Is that at the local police station, the county sheriff's office? Um, is there a trail before it gets to the state police that these fees will accumulate? and grow by the time it reaches, the fingerprint reaches its final destination? Uh, in the bill, sir, it states that the fingerprints must be transmitted through a live scan fingerprint vendor licensed by the Department of Financial and Professional Regulations. Which in, in my experience, <clears throat> for my case, excuse me, is my local police station and uh, county sheriff's office and I know how much they charge for that so with this $30 fee is that just a hope is it actually in the bill it is sir it is written in the bill that it will be capped at $30 so this bill will tell local police stations and county sheriff departments or anybody licensed to do this fingerprinting that regardless of what they charge and what their overhead is to do this, that they're going to have to settle for $30. So by doing that, if they charge over that $30, say for administrative fees, it covers their administration, they're going to have to find other sources to make up for that as well. 
The cap is that is that a fair assumption? The cap at thirty dollars uh, breaks down a barrier and makes this accessible, which is something that folks on your side have spoken to. I understand that, and that that's good for somebody who is willing to pay that thirty dollar fee. The point is, we're forcing a fee, an administrative fee, if. I charged $50 and that covered a service that I provided and now I get hit with a law that says I can only charge 30. Where do I make up that $20? You're asking me that question? Yeah. yeah. What, what, what will we say when constituents call or these organizations call our offices and say, where do I make up that $20 now? This fee cap has been negotiated by licensed fingerprint dealers and it is supported by them. Uh, it, it just appears to me uh, that this is full of um, a lot of areas that a lot of money is going to be generated uh, and we have no answers to supplement the losses that the licensed fingerprinters will have to lose. Um, the municipal police departments, the county sheriff's department, so, and I'm not sure, and uh, with DNR, with the Wildlife and Fish Fund, to the bill. Um, as a representative on the other side spoke earlier, asking us to recognize certain situations, it's only fair that we ask for that side to recognize things as well, too that basically this bill, as genuine it is, it is trying to be, will not prevent somebody who is vicious, determined, and evil from performing an act that they are bound and determined to do. I personally would love to see some form of legislation or a law that could keep that from happening. But I don't know where that possibility is to control somebody who is vicious and evil, like we have seen, unfortunately, so many times in our country. Representative Love, you're out of time. Thank you. I'm done. Representative Weber. Leader Weber. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Does the sponsor yield? She indicates she will. Thank you. Yeah, I have uh, been reached out uh, by many residents of my district, uh, many law abiding, void card carrying um, individuals. And just on their behalf, I wanted to ask a couple questions. Um, do you think that there should be fingerprinting on things like voting or on things like publishing a newspaper, uh, protesting, or possibly any other constitutional rights? Sir, I'm here to answer any questions on House Bill 1091. So I would take that as a no. It's only law-abiding, foreign-carrying uh, Illinoisans. Thank that, you. That is not what I said, sir. Representative Winhurst. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the sponsor yield? She indicates she will. Thank you. Representative, I appreciate the conversations you've had with me before on this bill. I just had some things I'd like to follow up on. Uh, so if you would indulge me with these questions. Do you recognize that the right of an individual to possess a firearm is a constitutional right? I do, Second Amendment. Are you aware of any other constitutional right that requires a person to pr provide a fingerprint to the government before they exercise that right? The government can restrict certain constitutional rights, rights for public safety purposes, and this is a compelling reason. The, the gun violence epidemic in this country is a compelling reason for that. My question wasn't that. My question was, are you aware of any other right that requires a person to submit a fingerprint to the government before they exercise the right? Could you tell me? 
I don't believe there is. That's why I, but I didn't know if you were aware of one that I was not. Are you? Thank you. We, you're the, the lawyer, so. <laughs> so I think that's a big concern that we have on this side. And as Representative a prior speaker said, a discretionary or voluntary pr uh, provision for fingerprinting with an expanded FOID card time would be more agreeable than mandating it through the government before exercising that right. And I, I hope you see where we come at with that difference and distinction. I also appreciate the discussions we've had on this issue. Um, and I, again, you know where I'm coming from, that this is a public health crisis, and we do a lot of things as a society for the good of public safety. I believe that this is one. You've uh, made statements about certain provisions in the bill that will be amended in the Senate. And I'm assuming by that statement you have a Senate sponsor? I do. And you've worked out these changes and amendments with them? The changes I have spoken to on the floor have been cleared with my Senate sponsor. For me personally, it is um, aggravating, I guess, for the amount of legislation that comes through this body with a promise of future changes in another body which we have no control over. And you know, that is something and a practice I would like to see us get away from because I think we have the opportunity now to put it correctly rather than waiting and hoping someone else does. Let's say that uh, there is no amendment and the bill passes in its current form in both the House and the Senate. Would you call on the governor to veto the bill? That's a hypothetical. Yes, but a very important hypothetical question because once we pass this bill, we lose control. You are the only one who can control what you're going to say to the governor, and I want, would like to know if you're going to request his veto if it passes in its current form. I understand uh, the frustration I hear from you. I, I, I'm new here, as everyone knows, um, but I too have seen how that happens a lot. However, I am working very closely with my Senate sponsor, and I have every confidence that it will be amended in the Senate. But if it is not, would you request a veto of the governor? Yes, we would request an amendatory veto. You did not present this bill in committee, is that correct? I did not. Were you, I, did you watch the, the presentation of the bill in committee when it was presented? I did not. I will let you know. Um, I advocated for this bill uh, as a member of Moms Demand Action in 2019. Uh, so I, while I have not been presenting and working on it, uh, as Representative Willis has, it is a very important piece of legislation that I am invested in. I understand that. The reason I bring that up is in committee, the uh, state police director testified about the bill in the form it is now with this amendment. And he expressed his concerns about the five-year period in the bill. Now, I understand all the promises that have been made, and we think it's going to come back, and if it does, this is going to happen. But we have to understand this bill in this form would create tremendous problems for the FOID card system in our state, a state that is already strained and stressed through this pandemic and currently. We cannot put more stress on that system. Would you agree with that? And where her time is up, Representative Severn says, you it's time. Thank you. I do fully agree with that. Uh, we have worked hard with ISP on these efficiencies in the bill, and we recognize that the five-year limit uh, kind of makes those efficiencies moot, you know. So um, it is important to ISP and to us that we amend the bill to $10 in 10 years. Thank you for your answers uh, to the bill. We have some fundamental disagreements on this side as it comes to this bill. One of the fundamental agreements is whether a FOID card should even exist and whether we should have it. Most states, in fact, the vast majority of states do not even have a FOID card. And there are many on our side who have sponsored bills to remove that. But if we are going to have a FOID card system, we should not be mandating fingerprints by law-abiding citizens to exercise constitutional rights. That is too far. 
And for that reason, I would encourage a no vote. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to go straight to the bill. Um, you know, during this argument, we have heard that uh, this is the bill that we're we're voting on, and I will remind folks that this this is the bill that we're voting on, regardless of any Senate amendments or whether it goes to the governor's desk and uh, what happens from here. But I find it uh, coincidental that early on in the arguments, the sponsor had said, "I'm not aware of." Anything going on in the Senate, I'm not aware of any agreed bill. I'm not aware of any negotiations whatsoever. And further and further on debate, all of a sudden there's an agreed bill in the Senate. All of a sudden there's discussions. All of a sudden there's amendments. Um, so we see that maybe there's some inconsistencies there. Secondly, to this, this will do nothing but be a detriment to our local districts. The facts are... This bill, HB 1091, requires fingerprints for renewal and new applicants for a FOID card, reduces the length of FOID card from 10 to 5 years, and coincidentally, I'm waiting on, on mine right now, and a lot of folks in my district are too, to the, to the tune of a, a, a little over a year. It quadruples the cost and outlaws private sale of firearms. Now, in southeast Illinois, in the district that I, that I represent, you know, the IDES is, is a major issue, and it, it truly is. But the number one call, and my LA has gotten very good at handling, is, is FOID cards. What's the status of my FOID card? Why haven't I gotten it? And what can you do to help? And it's always nice to help law-abiding citizens exercise their Second Amendment rights. And I take great pride in that. But to think that the Illinois State Police will have, have it any easier is just completely false. And... I have an FFL dealer in my district, and he sent me a text the other day. He said, here's a picture of my employee's niece who was excited to have finally received her FOID card. But to her surprise, her name is correct, but the person in the photo was not. They didn't even get the, the, gender, the gender right. It, it, it was a male instead of a female. So folks, to think that we're solving the FOID, to think that we're doing anything to help the issue that we're getting calls on on a daily basis is just completely false. So I would urge a no vote. Thank you. Representative Meyer. Yes. To the bill. You know, I have my great grandfather's gun. Never before have we had to go through a gun dealer to transfer that gun to the next in line in our family to have it. Now, what if I wanted to go to a great nephew? There's another time, not just a nephew, another time it has to be transferred down. Another payment. It, it seems ridiculous for a constitutional right that we have, that we have to go through such painstaking regulations and time where we wait up to two years to get new FOID cards. Our offices are overburdened with the FOID cards all the time. And not only do we have to do our districts, we have to do your districts. I constantly have people calling my office saying they don't get progress from their district. And they ask us as a Republican to help fight to get their FOID card and to get it renewed. Think about that. Vote no. I'd like to yield my time to Steve Reich. Representative Reich. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll be brief. A couple of points I've been listening to this debate. If you want to do away with gun violence in, <clears throat> in Illinois, one of the best ways to do it is enforce current law, which is to arrest and prosecute straw buyers. Those guns that are being bought out of the back of somebody's car were bought legally from an FFL by somebody who had no intention of doing anything other than handing it off to somebody else. You go to a crime scene and what happens is you find a gun, you can trace the gun through the serial number unless it's been filed off. They know where that gun was bought. Find out who bought it. Prosecute them. Send them to jail. Don't go sending innocent law-abiding gun owners 
halfway across the county to get a fingerprint. We're hearing a lot about this bill is going over to the Senate and there's a lot of work going on. Well, there's an agreed bill already over in the Senate. I'd like to know who the um, sponsor of this bill has been negotiating with over in the Senate <clears throat> because there is a bill over there that is agreed. And you want to know something? The bill that's going to come out of the Senate is going to be an agreed bill. The, the, the Rifle Association and all the other stakeholders are on this bill, state police. What you're doing by passing this bill is encouraging the people who are arguing for your, for your position over there to walk away from that process. They're going to say, oh, hey, look, we got a bill coming over from the House that gives us everything we want. Why should we, why should we negotiate anymore? Why should we come up with a bill? You want Republican votes on a, on a, on a, on a Floyd bill? Wait for the Senate to do its job and send that bill over here. Don't send this piece of garbage over there for them to fix. There's a bill over there. Let's do that. Finally, fingerprints. One thing, you know, when I took the bar exam and passed it, I had to give my fingerprints to the State Bar Association. Anybody who's a licensed professional in this state has to do the same thing on, under most circumstances. If you're a teacher, you got to give your fingerprints. That's fine, because you know something? For me to practice law or for somebody else to teach, that is not a fundamental constitutional right. Owning a firearm is enshrined in our Constitution. It's a fundamental liberty that we enjoy because we're Americans. And requiring us to make fingerprints available so that we can do that. I've, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I think that there is an argument there that it could be also a Fourth Amendment violation of my right to un unreasonable searches and seizures. So wait for the bill to come over from the Senate. Don't pass this bill. Let's wait for the Senate to do its work. Send an agreed bill over here and you might end up with some Republican votes on it. If what you're trying to do is just get yourself some talking points that you can take on a campaign trail next year. You're doing a fine job, but if you want something that actually works, let's wait for the Senate to send their bill over and let's see if we can vote on it. Thank you. Vote no. Representative Mason. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the sponsor yield? In the case she will. Thank you. A lot of people in this body may not know this about me, but I am a current FOID card holder. I come from a family with a long history of hunting and fishing, and I believe in the Second Amendment. Representative, will this legislation prevent me as a legal FOID card holder from owning a gun or purchasing guns? It will not, Representative. It won't, it won't stop my constitutional right to owning a firearm in any way? It will not. Thank you. Representative, um, we have been assisting in my district office with hundreds of individuals who have current FOID card issues. As a Democrat, I know that many of the other Democrats on this side of the aisle have been doing the same. Does this legislation include uh, items that will increase efficiencies to help those people who are deserving of FOID cards, get those FOID cards in a faster manner? It absolutely does, Representative. Thank you for that question. It re it's language provided by ISP, uh, which I outlined in my opening, but I'll just do a few quick hits for you. Um, you know, it allows automatic FOID renewals with an FTIP. It allows you to automatically renew your FOID when your CCL is renewed, and um, it does that nifty electronic FOID card, which would be good for everybody, among other things. Thank you, Representative. I know people in my district will appreciate that. Um, Representative, is the bill that's currently in the Senate an agreed bill? Thank you for that question again. Uh, it is not an agreed bill. 
The bill that is in the Senate is not agreed to by the advocates who have worked tirelessly on this issue for years. This reflects the work of advocates along with language requested from ISP in this bill. Thank you. Representative, I heard some folks uh, question the costs associated in this bill. So you're telling me that you have an understanding that uh, this, this will cost folks $10 for a 10-year FOID card? That is correct. And $30 for a fingerprinting fee? Yes, a one-time fingerprinting fee. Okay, very good. Um, I know that even a small box of ammunition costs 34, 30 to 50 bucks. Um, and for those who are hunting for food, the cost of getting a deer process starts at about $120. So that doesn't seem unreasonable to me, does it, Representative? I would agree with that. Thank you. Um, you know, folks are, as I drive here, speeding down Route 55. And uh, I see it all the time, even those without legislative plates. Did that stop us from implementing Scott's law to, to have people slow down, even though we know people will keep speeding? It did not, because it is a public safety measure. Thank you, Representative. And finally, we know that domestic violence is at epidemic proportions, and uh, it continues despite, of course, being illegal, including the domestic violence situation that killed Officer Oberhauer the other day and injured his partner. Um, do we stop that from pursuing domestic violence legislation, even though we know people will break those laws and need to be held accountable? Absolutely not, because our one job is to keep Illinoisans safe. Absolutely. To the bill. Folks, this is something that is going to help keep us safer. It is not going to protect, protect people, or not going to prevent people from exercising their Second Amendment rights. Um, we cannot stand down because people are going to break the law. This is a huge puzzle, and this is a piece of it. We need to have strong legislation, and then we need to also work with our law enforcement partners to ensure that these things are, um, are implemented. So I thank you. I know how hard you've been working for years on this before your time in the legislature, and I urge everyone to vote yes. Representative Stonebeck. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the sponsor yield? In the case, she will. Thank you. Um, I've been listening to this robust debate for the past, I believe, more than an hour. And I'd like to respond to some of the comments that I've been hearing. The first one is extremely disturbing to me. So this bill was referenced by one of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle as a piece of garbage. A piece of garbage. I'm sorry, but is this the way we treat each other in the Illinois House of Representatives? Is that a show of respect? Even if we agree to disagree, we agree to disagree every single day. We will not see eye to eye, possibly on this issue and on many other issues. But I would ask for respect for the advocates, for the current bill sponsor, for the former bill sponsor, for all of the work that has been done on this bill. And it is a tremendous amount of work, hours and hours. And I, I want to thank the bill sponsor for all of her hard work and the previous sponsor for all of her hard work, all of the advocates and the Illinois State Police. We've, we've heard many comments about how the Illinois State Police needs and wants improved efficiencies to our flawed FOID system. And this bill will, it's been acknowledged by many, improve those efficiencies. But I also want to speak to the multiple comments about law-abiding gun owners shouldn't have to do this, because we're all law-abiding. Now, someone mentioned straw purchasers. Representative Hershauer, are you familiar with straw purchases? Yes. And can you explain briefly what a straw purchase is? 
uh, a person who buys guns legally and then sells them illegally to a person without a FOID card. There have been many comments here. Oh, it's not us law-abiding gun owners that FOID card holders that are that are you know uh, committing the crimes. It's it's people with illegally trafficked guns. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, many times that's right. But straw purchasers actually have a FOID card and they purchase using their FOID card illegally and then resell those guns or pass them illegally to someone who is not able to, to obtain a gun. This is something that we have to stop and this bill would help that. So not everybody who is a valid FOID card holder is law abiding. I also want to reiterate uh, the situations of domestic violence. So in situations of domestic violence, the presence of a gun increases the chances of gun homicide by 500%. In many times, if there is a domestic violence suicide or suicide and gun homicide in a family situation, that person is a legal gun owner, is a law-abiding, up until that very moment, was a law-abiding gun owner. And then something happened. There was a domestic fight. They lost their job. They were getting a divorce. So not everybody who has a valid FOID card ends up being a law-abiding gun owner. Um, I also want to talk about a little bit about revocations. Representative Hirschauer, you mentioned the Aurora shooting. In that situation, the shooter in Aurora did have uh, a FOID card, is that correct? That is correct. And was that FOID card revoked? It was not. A letter, I believe a letter was sent uh, and went unanswered. The validity, was re the validity of the FOID card was revoked, but the firearm was never removed, is that right? Correct. And would this bill assist in that revocation process? It, it does. It creates the Violent Crimes Task Force, uh, whose main job would be to safely go out into the community and address FOID revocations. Is that an important part of the bill? It is a critical part of the bill, a critical piece of the large puzzle that we have all been talking about in addressing the epidemic of gun violence. So now that we've established that not everyone who has a valid FOID card holder is a law-abiding gun owner, actually I will throw out there, I know it's been said there were 2.1 million people in Illinois with FOID cards in 2017, Representative Stolbeck, your time has expired. So, Representative Carroll will yield his time. Thank you. So um, in, there are 2.1 million FOID card holders in 2017, and in that year alone, actually in 2016, in a single year, 11,000 people had their FOID cards revoked. And fewer than half actually turned in their firearms or had any sort of documentation as to where their FOID cards and firearms went. So is Representative Hirschauer, does this sound like an effective FOID system to you? It does not, which is why we are addressing that issue in this bill. So I'd just like to say that that is a critical part. There are tens of thousands currently FOID card holders who are not law-abiding, who have had their FOID cards revoked, and the Illinois State Police has not had the tools they need in order to be able to dispossess those illegal FOID card holders of their firearms. So that is critical to our public safety right here, right now, today. So to the bill. The Center for Gun Policy and Research of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, they published a report right around the time of the Aurora shooting in February of 2019. The report, which I have right here, is titled Policies to Reduce Gun Violence in Illinois. This report was prepared by professors, researchers, with years of experience and expertise in the issue of gun safety policy. The purpose of their report was to provide an overview of current Illinois firearm policies 
summarize evidence relevant to policies associated with reductions in gun violence and provide policy recommendations that Illinois should consider as part of its gun violence prevention reduction efforts. These renowned experts used research, data, and to recommend evidence-based policies to reduce gun violence. At the top of the list was mandatory fingerprinting and a five-year duration. Multiple other recommendations are also addressed in the bill. And I would also like to say that they recommended in-person background checks, in-person fingerprinting at a law enforcement agency, which is not in this bill. This, is, this bill could be much stronger. I'd like to read an excerpt from the report. I quote, Illinois arguably has the weakest of all purchase licensing laws. Illinois' law does not require fingerprint verification for background checks or safety training requirements. The report goes on to note that in 2017, gunfire took the life of 1,547 Illinois residents, including 934 homicides and 577 suicides. Illinois' firearm homicide rate, 7.3 per 100,000 population, is higher than all but five states. In fact, Illinois Summit has some of the highest levels of gun-related crime in the country, taking a devastating toll. From 2008 through 2017, 12,068 people were killed with guns in Illinois. From 2014 through 2018, there were 164 mass shootings in Illinois. A total of 111 people were killed and 669 were injured. Since then, gun violence has seen a dramatic increase. Undoubtedly, pandemic stress has, become, has been a contributing factor. I'd also like to say that, very sadly, the burden of gun violence in Illinois falls disproportionately on communities of color. Approximately 75% of the state's gun homicide victims are black. However, only 15% of the state's population is black. In Illinois, shootings are the leading cause of death for young people. So you may have seen some of the supporters of the bill wearing this button. And it says, our one job, and it has a fingerprint on it. Because as Representative Hershauer previously mentioned, it's our one job to keep Illinoisans safe from gun violence. So we need to ask one another, what number of gun deaths, what number of mass shootings, what number of gun suicides are, is going to be the tip of the iceberg? When are we going to say, this is enough, enough people have died from gun violence? I say, that this is a critical bill. please bring your remarks to a close. Yes, I will. Um, uh, this is a critical bill not only to improve efficiencies in the FOID system, but it's to protect public safety and prevent firearms from falling into the hands of those who should not have them. As legislators, we have a responsibility to fix our flawed FOID system and stop criminals from getting easy access to guns. This is something we can and must do right here, right now, today. It's been more than two years since the Aurora shooting, and the public has been waiting for the Illinois legislature to act. We can't just keep sending thoughts and prayers. We have many moments of silence in this body, and I would strongly urge every one of my colleagues here to honor the victims of the Aurora shooting and all victims Please of gun violence with an I vote. Thank you. I strongly urge an I vote. Representative Tarbert. We're good? Okay. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Representative Hershauer, first of all, thank you and thank uh, Leader Willis and all the others for all of your hard work. I, um, unlike Representative Mason, everybody knows that I have, uh, I'm a firearm person. And like Leader Hammond, I have a couple cards here myself. Uh, the reason why most people know that I'm a firearm owner, though, is because I ended up in a newspaper. 
for these two things right here. And I want to be very clear, there's some unintended consequences at times. So if you'll bear with me, I'll do my best on time. November 18th or so, 2019, I picked my daughter up from STEM at school, dropped her off, went about my business. I ended that night cuffed to a bench for seven hours over this. Except these were valid. That's the key. Okay? And there were six police officers behind me, treated much differently than my predecessor, who's a great woman, Barbara, I know you're probably listening. Right? But I didn't get treated like a 77-year-old white woman would in my own district or anywhere, right? Cuffed to a bench, told I had to take a charge. Take a charge, right? And the only reason, I don't know if you're aware of this, the only reason I was finally let go, again, we're talking about this. The reason why I was finally let go after being denied phone calls and things like that was because my sister showed up, who happened also to be a lawyer, at 2.30 in the morning. She also called Cam Buckner 30 times. He didn't answer. That's a different story. True, right? And I was able to finally go ahead and, you know, get home and go about my business. But now I have an eight-year-old who you all met, and thank you for your patience with her. But she can Google her father and see that I have a mugshot because of this. So I'm happy at a minimum to be combining cards. But I don't think this goes far enough, and I want to make sure we have a very candid conversation because I talked to ISP several times. I talked to Sergeant Thompson or Lieutenant Thompson. John Thompson is his name, Okay. And I told him from the beginning, and there was a bill in Justice Committee as well, email notifications and text messages should be across the board anyway. But I don't see anything in this bill that allows for that on the front end. People don't stay necessarily in their homes for 10 years or so. We had that conversation yesterday. That's why we passed the Supreme Court map, because people don't stay where they were necessarily always. Okay? So I get a letter at my old address from 10 years ago and it becomes an issue. I take care of the state police, I still get pulled over because the systems have not caught up with each other, and I'm screwed, okay? So I want a commitment from you to continue to work on this because I asked uh, Thompson, when I finally said, give me the contract for your vendor since you can't seem to do email notifications, he came back and said, we can do it, our vendor can handle it. So there's nothing to suggest that they can't handle giving notifications before the card expires. That 90 days, they can do that, Mara. So I want your commitment, please. Not just for me, because I have a sister apparently who can show up at 2.30 in the morning as a lawyer, but for the other folks. I've had other reps reach out to me about people in their districts who've been charged with UUWs, unlawful use of weapons, felonies, because of simple things like this. And I'm sure you know what they look like. That's the first point. The Foyd Appeal Panel. I have some reservations about that. Now, I'm glad that it's not going to be solely in the hands of ISP. That's important to me. But the Floyd Appeal Panel, based on my reading, is primarily made up of former prosecutors, judges, and there is a mental health professional, which I think is important. Would you be willing to work with me to ensure that someone who is maybe a public defender, we're going to be lawyer heavy, we should be somewhat balanced in that. Would you work with me on that? Absolutely, Representative. Okay, that's, that's important to me. I also have an issue with the timing. Now, we talk about law abiding citizens. I consider myself one until apparently Chicago police said that I wasn't one. Okay? 45 days on this four review panel, business days, is a long time for somebody to continue to wait when the state has been derelict in issuing licenses anyway. So I need your commitment to work on something. I, I can't give you a magic number, but 45 business days is not that number. Will you work with me to reduce that number? Absolutely, Representative. I appreciate that. Another thing that seems to be a little bit weird in the language is there's this shall notify if that panel needs more time of 30 days. What I don't see is some kind of a backstop. So what I don't anticipate but certainly don't want to see is an opportunity to continue to deny my license. You know, if I say 15 times I need 30 days, that's 450 days. Will you work with me to ensure there's a backstop that you can't just continue to say I need 30 more days? Absolutely, Representative. Okay. And I don't want a gun just issued you know, to, to anybody, or whatever, but I want to make sure that we have that on the back end. Um, Representative Buckner touched on the issue that we both had about the uh, indictment piece, but I want to make sure for a clear record. It's now my understanding, I've been enlightened, thank you, staff, that the indictment piece for any felony is actually federal in nature, and I don't think that's something that we can actually do anything about. Is that your understanding as well? That is also what I was told by staff. 
Okay, so that's my understanding as well. So I appreciate you asking staff, and I appreciate staff providing that, uh, that response. The other thing... One second. The other thing that I want to talk about, and I'm not asking you to change this on the Senate side, but I am asking for your help in a trailer bill, at least as far as facil facilitating a conversation. Representative Tarver, time has expired. Representative West yields his time. Thank you, Representative West. I'll be very, very brief in this one. So right now, there's the ability to expedite the process for law enforcement to have, have the firearms returned to them. Now, again, I'm no expert in this space, but if we're having law-abiding citizens wait 45 business days or whatever it is, I have some concern about law enforcement. Let's talk about Chicago, where I represent, right? What they tell state reps who are lawyers, you have to take a charge. Um, if a law enforcement officer shoots, I don't know, somebody unarmed in the back, and in Chicago they're now on desk duty, I have some concerns about them having a firearm immediately returned to them. Again, I'm not asking you to do anything about that right now, but I want your commitment, as I've been working with you and trying to help you with this, to help me look at that issue. Okay? Yes, Representative. I, the conversations that we have had, I mentioned in my opening how learning on the job has been one of the best parts of this new job for me and learning about intent of a bill and how that affects different people around the state of Illinois is so important to the crafting of legislation and our discussions I take very seriously and you have my commitment. I, I appreciate that and I just want to thank you again for jumping in and taking over something. I want to thank again Lita Willis as well. Um, you all are taking us in the very, very difficult trying to manage a lot of uh, expectations. And I really appreciate all of your hard work. I appreciate your willingness to take a phone call on a Saturday, or one, well, I guess it's Saturday now. But generally, you, you, you work hard on your bill. You've texted me, you've called me. You've taken everything into account. I really appreciate that. I, um, I look forward to continuing to work with you. And I appreciate you trusting me to help you with this bill. And I'm going to trust you to help me with what we discussed going forward. Thank you very much. I urge you vote. Representative Hirsch, how to close? Wow, it's, it's, it's done. Okay. Um, I wasn't expecting that. Um, first, there are a few things I want to address that came up from members on the other side. Um, it, I cannot state strongly enough that the bill that is being discussed in the Senate is not an agreed upon bill. To state so is false. The advocates have not agreed to any language in that bill. This is a bill that advocates have agreed on with language from ISP that will both keep our communities safe and help with efficiencies in the FOID card system. The second thing we've spent a lot of time talking about is um, amendments in the Senate. As I said, I understand the frustrations people say, people feel when we say we will amend in the Senate. Again, for the record, I am stating that this bill in the Senate will be amended to uh, a $10 fee in 10 years. Um, and you have my commitment that if it does not come back with that change, then I will request an amendatory veto from the governor. Third, really quickly, I wanted to address something that Mr. Meyer brought up. Um, on page 36 of the bill, it does address family-to-family -family transfer um, of firearms, and it's just an easy transfer. If you want to transfer to someone in your, in your family, notify ISP within 60 days, and they'll do the background check. So that is accounted for in this bill. I would like to thank each and every person on both sides of the aisle who got up to speak on this issue. I know it is a very uh, emotional issue, and while we may not always agree, I think the one thing that we can agree on, again, is keeping our constituents safe. Gun violence is a public health epidemic that plagues our state and our nation. Suicides, intimate partner violence, homicides, police shootings, gun, t gun violence takes many forms. All of them are lethal. This bill is not about politics. It's about saving lives and building an Illinois where all people are safe. In Illinois, where folks don't have to be scared of being shot while at work, or going to the park after school, or inside of their school building. I urge an I vote.
Members, Leader Wheeler. Leader Wheeler has requested a verification. All members will be in their chairs and vote their own switches. The question is, shall House Bill 1091 pass? All in favor, vote aye. All opposed, vote nay. The voting is open. Clerk, take the record. On this question, there are 60 voting in favor, 50 voting nay, zero voting present. And this bill having received the constitutional majority is hereby declared passed. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.